everybody. Uh, unlike Dr. Mitra, who saw many faces, I can only see one face, no prizes for guessing which face that is, which engages with the state of JNK. And I do hope that by the time, if ever, I am as eminent as Dr. Mitra, I'll see many more faces. So this is before I start an appeal that some of you should start engaging with JNK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, having, uh, having been a, an editor for six years, along with Sanjay, I can see the headline for tomorrow's newspapers. <laughs> Mitra tears into GST. <laughs> so now it is for, I certainly can't make a defense, but I do hope that my senior colleague, Mr. Modi, will try and restore the balance. I'll ask a few questions. <laughs> Whose GST is this? For the record, every single decision taken in the GST Council was by consensus. I will have many differences with what we arrived at, but that's what consensus is all about. Unlike both Unlike anybody in the council, JNK is the only state that had no constitutional obligation to go along with GST. We have our own constitution. I, as the finance minister of JNK, draw my powers from section 5 of the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. And as my opponents in the state keep reminding me, I wrote extensively against GST that will compromise the sovereignty of the states and the loss of sovereignty of states. But after going through the Empowered Committee deliberations and the deliberations of the GST Council and taking a long-term view, we actually got a special presidential ordinance issued for JNK so that we could participate uh, in the GST regime. So, uh, I certainly would own up every single decision of the GST Council and take it that this is what I, not contributed, but participated, what's and all, everything. I have absolutely no regrets on what we have done. The benefit of hindsight, you can surely reinvent many things. And we'll have time and occasion to discuss, hopefully, specifics that were raised here. Um, I'm sure, I mean, one keeps meeting business people and they're worried. Um, there's lack of clarity. We are in transition. But I'm sure that when you came in, you're worried. And when you leave, you'll be probably even more worried after you listen to Dr. Mitra. Um, <laughs> But I'm also worried because I see the ghost of Arnab Goswami everywhere. <laughs> what I'm going to tell you, the nation doesn't need to know. <laughs> the public doesn't need to know. What I'll share with you is what interested people might want to know. Um, let me put out four or five points as I see it. And also, at the end, three or four things about way ahead. I think we'll get into specifics as we go along, but I'll try and do a broad picture as I see it, somebody who's an insider. And as I said, I take full responsibility for every single decision of the council, though I may not have agreed with many of them. I think the biggest gain out of GST is that this is India's first truly federal institution. As a state finance minister, I feel hugely empowered. 1991, the entire nature of economic regime was changed and the state finance ministers perhaps read about it in the newspapers. Today, when you have to change a tax rate on dried fish, not only there's a 30-minute discussion with the GST in council, we do a video conferencing. Is it okay with you guys? I think that's a major thing. And 
I'm sure both my senior colleagues, very eminent colleagues, do remember how the Planning Commission would fix everything and how we would have to fix our numbers to suit their requirements. All that is history. The Finance Commission, which very famously, Mr. Guhan called that it's an, a commission that barks at the center and bites the states, was never a federal commission. This is for the first time that not only has it a genuine federal institution emerged, it has also cannibalized a constitutional intruder in the form of planning commission. And that has given us tremendous flexibility. Revenues may not have increased, but how I organize, allocate all that has changed phenomenally. So it's given the sub-national level a kind of freedom that is unheard of. So we have federalized this economy in a major way. That's point number one. Second, associated, that for the first time, the union and the states have pooled their sovereignties with respect to taxes. That's a huge advantage. It can, it can actually change the political economy of this country and this nation. And you can structure for, in functional ways. So you can adapt it to change and recognize the diversity of India in a truly empowered sense. And third, which I felt while I was there, somewhere without intention, we discovered an alternative way of formulating laws. Believe me, many times I felt I was a part of a drafting committee of the Constitution of India. Dr. Bitsa will remember this. Line by line, on the fly, we would make changes. It hasn't even happened when the Constitution of India was drafted. You had 29 finance ministers contributing to it, not for you know, conceptual and operational issues, no, drafting issues. And I don't think anywhere in the world would this have happened, section by section, law by law. So many errors, many errors that we find today are our contributions to it. So in, it's a disorderly way of how do you organize and how do you democratize lawmaking in a country like India. So that was a kind of a, you know, uh, just long that we discovered. So I think these are three major gains uh, besides our small little businesses that we may have for gains to the country. Structurally speaking, again, I mean, I think I would rate this whole transition, which I still call transition, this move towards GST regime. It may not be as glamorous as globalization or liberalization, but it has certainly is the, one of the biggest moves for formalization of the Indian economy. If I look back and go to the 80s, what we did was liberalize, globalize, and now formalize. I would have actually done formalization first and then gone into liberalization and globalization. But nevertheless, I think it's as important an event which will transform the economy as in economic history, historians perhaps will write, it. they'll put it at par with globalization and liberalization. But the most important thing that I find in this whole thing of GST and which I have a sneaking suspicion is the basis for all the resentment and the noise against GST, apart from operational difficulties, is the fact that GST changes the business ethics of this country. I think it's one of the most critical decisions where right from the design of exemptions, specific commodity specific where lobbying would happen, and you would actually know where the benefits are going. The budgets, if you were into business, I'm sure all of you could pick out which exemption is benefiting which industry, which industrialists, I'll go to that extent. Commodity specific exemptions. 19 rates for footwear with specifics that it is plastic footwear, sole is plastic, top is leather, with laces has one rate. Because only one guy was manufacturing it. From there to disincentivizing cash, 
is a huge transition. And I think a lot of resistance from various places is coming because of that. I think the, the way GST will change the business ethics of this country will be historic. Uh, in terms of uh, problems, yes, many. Operational, technology, uh, I would, I would perhaps disagree that, you know, was it prematurely launched? We didn't have many options. By September 8th, or it was the 18th, we would have had a constitutional crisis because all the past transition had kind of been changed already. But where do we go from here? We have what we have, whether we like it or not. And we are in this together. Um, there are two or three things I'd like to say. One is the big concern that's emerging out of SMEs. Big concern, no doubt about it. And the core of it is that the traditional supply chain networks have broken. We need to repair them and restore them. Because the current system, it's not working in the sense that the GST, the big guys, are not buying from the composition guys, the small guys below 1.5 gross turnover, because input tax credit is not available. I think that's one of the, at the heart of this issue. And in the, in our desire to, towards the end to kind of placate everybody, we dropped a few things, but this is something in a B2C sense not happening, there's not, not much trouble, but I'll have one issue to say on that. B2B, the problem is that the SME guy in the composition scheme, the small guy, is not getting his business from the big guy because the big guy is not getting the input tax credit. So do we need to redesign somewhere the composition scheme to allow some form of input tax credit to be given so that those supply chain is restored? That is point number one. We need to discuss this. I have some thoughts on it. We could, we could take it further. Second, in a general sense, I'm extremely discomfortable with the idea that we have an MRP in a GST regime. The two don't go together. MRP uh, was in a pre-liberalized kind of environment when the producer prices would put a margin, a distribution margin, arrive at an MRP. Now with the consumption tax happening, how will you work backwards? And what has happened invariably, and I have seen this myself as a customer, is that GST is charged 18% or 12% over and above the MRP. Now, till the system stabilizes, one would kind of expect ethically that uh, GST should be a part of MRP, but it is not on ground. And we need to now just abolish MRP to allow market forces and allow different repriced goods, depending on their costs and whatever, to arrive at the prices. I think that's one key way forward. Third, that we need to undo two things which the council did. One, the council deferred the reverse charge mechanism up to March. I think we need to bring it back as soon as possible. That may also be the way forward for repairing the supply chain networks, because if the ITC, the small guys who supply to the big guys, and the big guys does an RCM for them, and we adjust it for the small guys' taxes, you could actually find a solution whereby the SME business will be restored. Second is the e-way bill. I think we again have kind of in a hurry. I am not disassociating myself from the decision. Please be clear on that. But we took the decision, and I think we need to bring it back ASAP, 1st of Jan, and that should address a number of concerns that are emanating right now in my state and other states. I think that's where... Uh, um, sorry. 
So that, that's the uh, SME part. Then uh, third is, uh, the, the third and final issue is that, um, which actually is more about state finances, which hasn't been yet discussed. Quickly, I think I am, and I've said this in the council also many times, that the states have got a wonderful deal. I have a complete tax insurance, which is under the composition law, at 14%. And I did argue in the council many times that, look, what happens to tomorrow if I become irresponsible? I don't levy taxes. I am guaranteed 14%. It doesn't matter for the next five years. Thanks to Charles and Mays, yes. I am guaranteed 14% year on year, even if I don't collect even if there's actually collection. And eBay bill, I'm seeing a lot of problems happening, a lot of tax evasion happening because of eBay bills in my state. So I have a virtual tax insurance policy for the next five years. And if the horizon of a politician is his electoral term, it goes beyond my term, so I'm not worried. <laughs> but what the thing that's happening, surely you need to worry for the center, and I have one worry for the center. But today, a very peculiar situation that is apart from the main numbers that Dr. Mitra gave. One number is that there is unutilized IGST of about 1,20,000 crores lying in the center. Whose money is this? I want to lay my claim on it in this very good forum. So that tomorrow somebody picks up in the newspaper and says 1,25,000 crores need to be a part of the division package now that the Finance Commission has been set up. So there is a lot of mismatch in the numbers because there are classificational issues and we are not getting the full data from the GST and Council. In fact, I wouldn't hesitate to say this very bluntly, that a large part of the problem arose because of that, because of the way the Council was not briefed properly about technology and operational issues. There's no doubt about it. And GSTN Council at that point of time should have briefed the, the GSTN should have briefed the GST Council about all the glitches and whatever that we spoke about. But nevertheless, there are also issues that A, information should be shared. I think we are just starting the first dump of data has come this month. I, I, I think first data. So we'll look at the, we'll look at the numbers. Um, uh, we'll look at the numbers. Uh, how they are panning out. I wouldn't take a call on it right now um, on trying to analyze data and seeing the shortfalls. The last GST council that we met, we had a surplus on the composition account of about 12,000 crores. That's the last I remember because I haven't got any formal data um, after that. So the numbers, how they have panned out in October, November, I'm not aware. But the last I remember, and uh, uh, Modiji will correct me if I'm wrong, I remember that there was a 10,000 crore surplus on the compensation account, which is what prompted the rate cut spree from 28 to 18, from 18 to 12. I think that is also a part of the whole management of the optics of GST, uh, because the optics of GST got very, very murky somewhere two months, three months back, and we went into a huge rate uh, rates spree and all that. Um, also, that while I completely agree we need to simplify the system, and that should be our next major part of the uh, of the council. Currently, we are engaged in a rates rate cutting thing. But uh, eventually, I mean, and this has been recorded in the minutes, I think even in the first two council meetings, that eventually it will be a three-rate structure uh, with five, somewhere around 14, and then 28, because 12 and 18 will merge, which now the, I think the union finance minister has also spoken about it. I think you have also spoken about it. But it's always the understanding that this will happen, because we were getting into uncharted water, so we were, there were some gaps and so on and so forth. But I think the dispersal of rates from what has come down, each state having 20 rates, at least recognize the fact that there today we are only operating on four or five rates. That's it. So from the multiple rates that's come down, 
while I agree with the need for simplification, let's also not forget and overdo the compliance burden. Because I remember, I mean, businesses were filing separate returns, <coughs> sorry, for value add tax, for excise duty, for service tax, for countervailing duties, all that was there. And it has taken not even three months to forget all that was there to be filed. So, uh, so compliance distress does exist. I think a, a shift also into online and all that does cause some, some degree of anxiety. Um, but I think over the next three to four months, that's what the council should focus on and try and improve the technology piece so that the interface with businesses gets much simpler. But for me, at the end of the day, this is the first time, at least in my state, I'm seeing that the, the state commercial taxes department is not an inspector department, but the guys are filing on their own. It's, you, you do your own assessments, and subsequently, when you try and do inquiries are risk-based with some degree of scientific modeling of what the risk return profile is, high risk profile is, and then from there, you take only 5%. I think fairly well-designed system, perhaps over-designed to meet our requirements for the moment. But having said that, I just kind of add one, um, the last thing that I would like to say is that don't judge the system just yet. I'll give it a couple of more months to stabilize, and uh, if interactions with business and the government happen the way they've been happening, and the government is as responsive as it has, or the GST Council is as responsive as it has been in the last uh, two, three months, I think we should get towards a much more robust and well-functioning GST, which works well for businesses and governments at both levels, the union and the states. Thank you very much.